Damien here with Big Mood on Pens, back again with another fountain pen review. Today, I have something a bit different for you. I'm going to share with you some information about a fairly new line of luxury pens from Tasia called Palisades. And I don't have just one pen, I have 12. Uh, 10 from the Palisades line, as well as two amazing additional offerings from Tasia. Palisades is a sister brand to Tasia. The goal of the brand is to offer a variety of Japanese-made Arushi and Makie pens at an affordable price. Now, when I say affordable, when it comes to Arushi and Makie pens, that is a relative term. Uh, some of those pens can be very, very expensive. In regard to the price ranges of the pens you will see today, uh, they range from under just under $900 all the way up to over $5,000. So these are some very nice pens. Uh, the total value of about of what I'm going to share today is uh, just about $30,000. What I'm going to do is go over the parts and features of these pens, talk about what I care for and what I don't care for about them. Some of the pens match up well with my personal tastes, and there are some which do not. I'll show some size comparisons and provide a writing sample with a couple of them. Thanks go out to the good folks at Tasia for providing these pens on loan for me to check out. When it comes to reviews of luxury pens like these, you know, I kind of have two angles I go at things. Uh, there aren't a lot of reviews out there for pens such as these, so if you are in the market for something like this, I want to be able to provide you uh, some useful information. But I realize that for the majority of viewers, a video featuring pens like these uh, you know, are simply eye candy uh, that's fun to take a look at. And I want to make the, film, the video enjoyable uh, for those viewers as well. And these pens certainly do provide some eye candy. And like I said, I appreciate Tasia for letting me check these pens out and ink them up. So in order to get a closer look at these amazing pens, please join me over here at camera two. So let's take a look at some pens from Palisades. If you're not familiar, Pacific Palisades is an area of the Los Angeles, California region. It's right between Malibu and Santa Monica. If you're familiar with the video game Grand Theft Auto V, which takes place in San Andreas, which is a fictionalized version of Los Angeles, uh, Michael's psychiatrist, Isaiah Freelander, lives in an area of the map called Pacific Bluffs, which is inspired by Pacific Palisades. So you might have visited the area, albeit virtually. Uh, let's take a look at some pens. So here are some of the Palisades offerings, and I've put them in order from least expensive to most expensive. As I'm showing each of these pens, I'll display the price here on the screen. Uh, the size and dimensions are mostly the same, but there are a couple that um, are slightly larger. You can tell this; these two here are slightly uh, larger and thicker uh, and longer. The section on these are considerably larger or longer as well. Um, the nibs on these pens, let me actually put that down, are two-tone, uh, 18 karat gold. They are stamped with the Palisades P logo. These nibs are made by Sailor, which makes some of my favorite nibs. Uh, these are roughly the size of a number six nib and are available in extra fine, fine, medium, broad, zoom, as well as a music nib. Um, I have most of those sizes here, but not all. I don't have extra fine in Zoom. If you are not familiar with Sailor's Zoom nib, it can produce uh, different line styles depending on the angle in which you hold the nib to the paper. It's really fun to play with. Uh, these are cartridge converter pens. Uh, they do have metal housings, so eye dropping would not be recommended. Uh, these pens utilize Sailor converters, so if you care to use cartridges, you'll need to use those produced by Sailor as well. Um, some of the models have the Palisades name engraved on, uh, on the cap, and others do not. The Pens have a twisting faceted design, most of them though, there's one that doesn't. It's easiest to see here on this first pen, which is called the Sierra Line. You know what, now it's bugging me. Let me go ahead and at least cap these up. They're not inked right now, but gotta at least make it look neat on camera. So this is the Sierra Lime. Um, this is the least expensive of, uh, expensive of the bunch and uh, one of my favorites. 
Um, I like how the underlying green Arushi uh, just kind of accentuates that twisting faceted design. Uh, this model does have the company name engraved on the cap and filled with gold. You know, I can't say I'm a huge fan of engraving on an Arushi pen. And if you look close here, it might be hard to see, but the, uh, uh, the engraving is not the highest quality. So on this model, I wish they would have let this off. Um, there's only one other model I'll show you here today that has the engraving on the pen. Uh, the rest do not. Um, as I mentioned Previously, each of these pens are made from ebonite and either use Arushi or Mackie te techniques or both. On this pen here, it's using only Arushi. On the next pen, it is called the Wajima Cloth. Actually, I guess I got these in the wrong order. Uh, this is the Wajima Cloth Red. Uh, Wajima is a city in Japan, and this Arushi application is used to show a rectangular red cloth wrapped around this pen. Uh, next up, we have this pen here, which is called the Clo Coastal Glitter. Uh, on this model, the facets are accentuated by thin strips of rodden. Um, each of these are not one long piece of rodden. They do look very nice. Let me get that to focus there. They're broken up to p into pieces, which are about an inch long. But I will say the transitions between those pieces are very, very small, giving this uh, kind of illusion that it's one long uh, piece here. It's very nice craftsmanship. Uh, and then that one just has the black section. Then next up here is... Uh, this one is here is called the New Zealand Shell Green. And compared to some of the others, this one just doesn't do as much for me. For this me, for me, this green is a bit on the bland side. Uh, the shell work on the cap is interesting though. Uh, I love the natural variation of the colors. And from what I can tell, each facet is a solid piece. Um, this is the only pen in the group here where the facets aren't twisting but you can see that the section on this one is green as well. Okay, next up, these pens do reflect a bit, so uh, in the uh, light, but next up we actually have, the rest of these are in correct order. Uh, this one is called the Snowy Wave, which uses a combination of thin rodden strips as well as quail's egg. Um, I've really loved the look of quail's egg on fountain pens. Uh, sometimes it's quail's egg, sometimes it's duck egg, uh, but like I said, this one here is quail's eggs. Well, one of the things I love the most, let's see how close I can get here, uh, is uh, about egg pens is when you can see the pieces which were originally one piece but are broken up and placed next to each other. Um, that really reminds me that this painstaking process is intentional and completed by a talented artisan. So uh, a craftsman had to work a long time to create this piece of art. Uh, and as you can see here, this is the other pen, which is engraved with the company name. Um, as with the other model, I, I would have preferred this one uh, be left off. Um, this has been engraved directly into the eggshell and filled with a black lacquer. Um, while at a distance, it looks nice. Um, if you look at it closely, you can see like, well, let me get it to focus. Like the engraving on the other pen is not the greatest quality. Um, and that, you know, I just, there's just something about engraving directly into the eggshell, which I, I don't particularly care for. Okay, now we are getting into the pens which incorporate Mackie as well. Uh, this one here is called the uh, Takusan Kingo. Uh, Takusan is the Japanese word for a lot, and Kingyo uh, means goldfish. As you can see, it is appropriately named uh, since this pen has a lot of goldfish. Uh, and I do like that the one there's one goldfish here at the cap, which is a different color that makes for a, a nice artistic element to it. Uh, and the section on this one is black as well, but uh, this is a nice uh, pen there with the fish on it. I enjoy those. And next up, we have the Koi Pond. Um, now we have the Koi on here, the different Koi and the lily pads, and then these smaller circles, which might be plants or maybe air bubbles. Um, you know, I would love to have a koi pond at my house. Um, I also think the heron and hawks and raccoon and fox in my neighborhood would love for me to have a koi pond as well.
Okay, three of these palisades left. Next here, we have the Hukasai Akafuji. Uh, Hukasai is a famous Japanese artist who lived in the 17 and 1800s, and Akafuji translates to Mount Fuji in red, which we have Mount Fuji in red right there. Uh, and that uh, this one is an interesting combination of blacks and reds and greens and blues, and again with the black section. And this one here, we have the Princess Kaguya, which translates to Shining Princess. Now, the art on this pen is based on a 10th century Japanese fairy tale, which teaches the lesson that if you are really wealthy and respected, it doesn't necessarily make you happy if you are surrounded by people that you don't love. In the story, the princess, which is here with her flowing black hair, uh, she becomes less and less happy as she becomes more and more wealthy and climbs uh, higher in social ranks. So I think that one, the art looks really nice on this pen. And then I think it's interesting that it relates to a story as well. And you can see here on this particular pen that the uh, treatment goes into the section as well, which looks nice. And finally, we have the Hukasai Great Wave. I think this is my favorite of the group. Um, as I mentioned, Hukasai was an artist who lived in the 17 and 1800s. His most famous work is the Great Wave off of Kanagawa, which is depicted in this pen. Um, there are several versions of this painting in existence. Um, well, technically they are woodblock prints, not paintings. Uh, during the 1800s, over 8,000 of those prints were made, but it's now believed that only about 100 have survived. Um, I've been fortunate to see a few of them, uh, one at the Art Institute of Chicago, one at the Met in New York City, and I also ran across one by accident. Um, a few years back, I was fortunate enough to take the family on a trip to Paris, and we took a day trip out to Monet's house and gardens. If you are ever in the area, I would highly recommend to visit. It is incredibly beautiful. But as we were walking through the house, we were in the dining room, and sure enough, up on the wall was the Great Wave. I was just surprised to see a world-renowned piece of art in the dining room. But then again, it was the dining room in Monet's house. Uh, but I just love how the edges of the wave here um, almost look like fingers reaching out to crash down on this long boat. There's the long boat right there. Um, and then there is the Mount Fuji here in the distance. Uh, but then there's a variation on the theme in the bottom, uh, which Mount Fuji isn't here on the bottom, so the design doesn't feel duplicitous. So uh, those are the Palisades. Let me know in the comments below uh, which of these pens is your favorite. Um, I've already said it, but the Great Wave is mine. Um, I also like this one very much. Uh, this one has a very interesting look to it as well. Now, I mentioned I have 12 pens, uh, and so we need to take a look at the last two. Let me go ahead and get rid of these. These last two pens to show you here are not part of Palisades, but they are from Tasia, and these are simply stunning and have price tags to match. Um, they are the Empress Shangri-La Tranquility and the Empress Golden Nectar. Um, let's look at the Tranquility first. Um, a while back, they released a model called the Empress Shangri-La Whispering Pond, which quickly sold out. So they created a new version of this pen, enhancing some of the applications. Uh, this is a limited edition of 20 pens. This is a large ebonite pen, similar in size to a Sailor King of pen. Um, the base is uh, a Midori Urushi, which is green and has lotus flowers in various stages of bloom. Uh, the Rankaku application of the quail's egg uh, in the lotus flowers and the rodden uh, just, uh, depicting the uh, flowing water and the cascading water it just really create uh, a rather serene and peaceful scene. Uh, there's even some uh, dragonflies, right? You can see that. There you go. There's some dragonflies here at the top with rodden wings, which is a nice use of that material. 
Um, then we have the artist's signature here at the bottom. Uh, and then the number of this specific pen. Uh, this pen is a zero of zero, which means it's the artist's proof. Sometimes you might see uh, AP to signify artist proof as well. Um, when you remove the cap, I like that the application continues over to the section. Um, you can feel that application just a little bit. The section isn't perfectly smooth, but I do like the feeling. Um, and then here we have Tasia's branded uh, King of Pen nib, which is outstanding. Um, I'm coming up with a pen project here in a few weeks, and I wrote over 300 thank you notes with this pen over the last couple of days. Uh, the nib is outstanding, and the overall looks of this pen are just a stunning combination of a variety of applications. Uh, and this pen will retail for $53.95. Okay, let's take a look at the Golden Nectar, the Empress Golden Nectar. Um, as with the Shangri-La, uh, Tashia had pre previously released a version of this pen called the Honey Bee, um, which quickly sold out. Uh, and in this updated version, it has orange blossoms on a Shiro Tamanuri background, which depicts raw honey. Um, on the flower petals, uh, there are two techniques being used. Uh, there is Rankiku, which is the quail's egg, and then there is Kinji, which I liken to a stippling technique. Let me see how close I can get in there. You can see the stippling on the gold, which are basically just dots. So it's not painted, it's basically just kind of stippled on there. Um, there are some parts to this pen which I find amazing. Um, I just love this half and half clip where half is rotten and half is that stippling technique. Um, then here on both the bottom and the top of the pen, uh, you know, it, at first I thought it was like flake or something like that applied to the end, but no. Uh, it's again that stippling technique and each of these individual dots has been applied by hand. Um, when you unscrew the cap, I can really, I, I really like this section. Um, this is just amazing. Uh, I like how the rodden starts more solid and then kind of fades away. Uh, and then also I really like the great shading on this Arushi. Um, this just looks fantastic. Uh, and then you have that same uh, King of Pen nib. Uh, this pen will also be a limited edition of only 20 units and retail for uh, $4,895. Now, quickly, I mentioned some size comparisons and a writing sample. Okay, let's actually turn this around for this. Um, in regard to the size comparisons, um, well, where we go? Here we go. Here are basically one of each model. Um, there, this one is the, uh, the Shangri-La, and then this is the Great Wave. And in regard to some size comparisons, this is what it looks like with a Sailor King of Pen, and that is the uh, Royal Tangerine. Uh, and then here it is with a Mont Blanc 149. And then here it is with a Leonardo Momento Zero Grande. Just to show you some differences between these nibs, this one is a medium nib, and this is basically, essentially, a medium king of pen nib from Sailor. Uh, and so, In regard to writing sample, the Shangri-La has a medium nib, uh, and then the Great Wave has a fine nib, uh, and then the Snowy Wave has the music nib. So let's just go ahead and look at each of these here quickly.
the King of Pen nib is just one of my favorites. It's just amazing. Uh, the ink that I'm using is one of my favorites, uh, which is the Tassia Saba Midori. Um, it's a really neat ink that starts off blue and then kind of dries green. Um, once it dries, it looks somewhat similar to Diamine November Rain or Robert Oster River of Fire. Um, but I just like the way this ink changes. I think it looks fantastic in a number of pens. Uh, and this is what the bottle looks like. I highly recommend this ink. And then here is the fine. This one was the medium. Uh, and then this is the fine. Move that over so you can actually see that. But you can see that does lay down a much finer line. And finally, we have the music nib, which is rather interesting. Uh, some music nibs have two tines, but Sailor's just has one. Uh, that's just the way they've always done it. But in regard to the music nib, And with that nib, you're going to find thinner lines when you go to the left and right and thicker lines when you go up and down. So this is just basically with no pressure whatsoever. And you can see there's a nice variation in lines. But I have a whole uh, video on music nibs if you'd like to see it. But basically it is so that we can write these music notes as well as write the lines. But they're very, very nice. So there we have the Palisades line from Tassia. They're not all going to fit in here, but at least give you a final look at some of them. Don't forget in the notes below to let me know what your favorite one is. Um, I think that they're interesting pens uh, and that I like that there's a variety so that not all of them might work for your personal taste, uh, but you might find one or two that you really enjoy. Uh, and they have some extremely nice craftsmanship to them. And I was glad to be able to check them out. Okay, until next time, thanks for watching, and I'll talk to you later.